hurried to make us noisy, to make us distracted, to fill God's people and to fill His church with so much noise and activity that there is no room for prayer. There is no room to be alone with God. There is no room for silence before God. There's no room for meditation with God. And so I rise today to sound the alarm that we need less noise from earth and we need more sounds from heaven. As Acts 2.2 2 says, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all. Somebody shout all. Oh. I want that sound from heaven. I want that sound from heaven. When prayer becomes your habit, miracles become your lifestyle. Never give up on prayer. No matter what comes your way, never give up on prayer. Joseph in the Old Testament waited 13 years. Abraham waited 25 years. Moses waited 40 years. Jesus waited 30 years. If you feel like your wait is long, you are in good company. So let's quit worrying about the future. Let's quit living in the past. Let's quit trying to please everyone. Let's quit putting ourselves down for our wrongs. And let's quit overthinking and underacting. So it's time for the church to rise up and say we must evangelize. We must have Bible studies in every home. We must have Bible studies in every block. Let's not criticize leaders. Let's not attend church infrequently. But let's volunteer our time for the kingdom of God. Let's work with our youth, our young adults, these millennials. Let's not complain more than we encourage. Let's take the Bible seriously. Every line. Not just that which talks about the blessings. But we also need to take serious the Word of God that says time is short. And time is is limited and he's coming back and there is a heaven and there is a hell and there is destruction and people are going there and we've got to sound the alarm we make sure that we value souls more than our own preferences I arose early this morning it was dark outside and I put aside the notes on the iPad and took up pen and paper and started to write. We need to preach not what people want to hear. Instead, we need to preach. We need to come out from this world and be separate. And here is my text, Titus 2, 11 through 15, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Oh, why did he give himself for us? That he might redeem us from 
all iniquity and purify. Somebody shout purify unto him or unto himself a particular people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort, rebuke with all authority, and let no man despise you. Friend, we need to be training. Let the Holy Ghost train us. Let God train us. Oh, I'm tired of people that want to be look holy and be blessed on a Sunday morning. But they live their lives Monday through Saturday as if there is no God. Oh, I'm reaching for a church. Come on right now. My job, my job as pastor is to instill in the church such living that when you walk out of these doors, you live your life so that others will look at you and say there's something different about you. There's some power I feel from you. That's why I preach prayer. That's why I preach Bible study. Amen. That's why I'm preaching you've got to get right with God and seek Him first. And oh, somebody shout yes. yes. So we need to let the Holy Ghost move within us according to Titus 2 and 12 to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live a self-controlled life that's upright and godly in our age. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to leave or abandon the attachments or the attractions of this world. The call of God sets a barrier between a man and this fleshly life. We must follow Him to be His servant. To follow Him. That means it's a cross and everything that goes with it. You want a crown in this life? He's got a crown of thorns. You want to be lifted up? Yeah, that's fine. But he was lifted up on a cross. Oh, when was the last time you wept over sinners? When was the last time you prayed for them to come to God? We don't even talk to them about God. We leave it all up to the preacher. Oh, but it comes back to me from Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10, 9 and 10, where God is challenging Cain. And he says, where is your brother? And he cries out, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer from heaven was, the blood of your brother cries to heaven from the ground from where it was spilled. Yeah. Friend, I'm preaching to this church. We should live our lives so that others see Jesus in us. Yeah. There should be the power of evangelism that comes from a transformed life uh, that's lived in our world. Yeah. And the reason for that transformation comes from Jesus Christ. Yeah. Somebody shout yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Y'all are sitting out there looking at me. Maybe some giving a golf clap. But I hope my burden is coming true. I hope my love. Uh, oh, friend, we got to love uh, the sinner. But we got to be able to tell them and show them there is a God. There is help. But, friend, on the other side of the coin, time one day will be no more. The trump of the Lord is going to sound. The great white judgment is going to happen. And men and women and children are going to stand before the great God of glory. What did you do? How did you live? What happened? And there's judgment that's coming. Somebody said you better not preach judgment. Friend, I'm here to tell you, we got to love people. But we got to love them with the love of God. Yeah, so we can preach for them and see them saved. Yeah, I don't want anybody to go to hell. I don't want anybody. I remember preaching hell so hot as a young preacher. And my father took me aside.
prophesied. And he said, son, this was good preaching, but you had no tear in your eye. There was no trembling lip when you preached about hell. It was almost as if you enjoyed sending someone to hell. Those words haunt me. Oh my God. I stand as a dying man preaching to dying people. There is a hell. There is a eternal lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Jesus talked about it more than he did heaven. Colossians 3.13 We should bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Give grace. It's one of the hardest things in our world to do is to forgive. The pain and hurt that others give us is real and it's great but the pain of living with bitterness and unforgiveness poisons our soul and it will destroy us when we forgive others we are not saying what they did was okay but we are releasing them to Jesus and letting go of that hold on us so we can be free. That's why Jesus, knowing there's a hell and a heaven, knowing there's a right way and a wrong way, he could, from a cross, where they gave him the crown, the crown of thorns, where they beat his back and they purged or pierced his side. He's nailed on that tree, but it wasn't nails holding him. No mere nails could hold the Son of God on that cross. His flesh submitted. He said, not my will, but thine be done. And that's when he lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, forgive them. Amen. Friend, that's the mark that's missing in the church today is forgiveness to let it flow. And we've seen it this week in action right here in Dallas, Texas. Forgiveness given by a victim's brother after the sentencing of his brother's killer. It was compassion given by the judge that came down and gave a Bible and hugged the one that was found guilty. And then little known to most people, forgotten, was an act of humanity. When after it all was said and done, the hug by the son. The hug and the offering of the Bible by the judge. But when the police officer in the courtroom, she stepped up and brushed the killer's hair. The protesters in the street with shouts of no justice, no peace. A white felon stands guilty at the bar. That these three acts, acts of forgiveness, acts of compassion, and acts of humanity, all given by the black brother. The black judge and the black police officer. 
President Reagan said, Abraham Lincoln freed the black man. In many ways, Martin Luther King Jr. freed the white man. How did Martin Luther King accomplish that tremendous feat? When others, black and white, preached hatred, Martin Luther King taught us the principles of love and nonviolence. And what I'm saying to this church today is in our life, we need to realize, yes, we've got to go to our world. We've got to reach them before it's too late. We've got to go. But we need to take forgiveness with us. Amen. Amen. I call for the video at this time. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I I forgive you, and I know if you go to God and ask Him, He will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even God, for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I, see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not gonna say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. she was running to him. And then at 3.30 Friday morning, 3.30 a.m., they came to her jail cell here in Dallas. Woke her up with the cuffs and the chains around the wrist, waist, and the ankle. And let her out. She started her journey to the prison. Forgiveness was given, but consequences were still to be paid. So she will be there for how many years? At the back and call of others, unable to do or go or be, be with. 
there's something that went with her. And that's that forgiveness. And that's that joy. Her life is shattered. Just like the brother. His name is Graham. That family is shattered. That family is forever changed. But he said, I'm not going to be bound with bitterness suffering. I'm going to let it go. He said, I love you like anyone else. And I forgive. So our heads are bowed here today. In our marriages, let's forgive. In our family relationships, let's forgive. In our business connections, let's forgive. In our schools, let's forgive. In our livelihood, let's forgive. In the church, let's forgive. And walk together. Forgive one another. Love one another. And if you are here today, you have not given yourself to Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Be filled with that blessed Holy Ghost. The power of Jesus who comes into your life. You will speak with tongues as the Spirit will give it. Be baptized in that powerful name of Jesus Christ. You can do it right now. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed.